famous aviatrix Amelia Earhart was beginning a program of air research that ended with her mysterious disappearance in the Pacific. This isn't just another ghost story from the ocean. If she did what she said she was doing, she should have made it to another islet. It's the one we've whispered about for nearly a century. We never hear from her again. She's been gone 87 years and we still don't have a definitive answer as, as to what happened to her. A fearless woman vanished into thin air, leaving no wreckage, signals, or answers behind. For 88 years, the Pacific held its silence. One of our members, we're a membership organization, called me and said, hey, we got a theory about Amelia Earhart. But in 2025, something stirred on the ocean floor. A sonar ping, a glint of metal, and a pattern that didn't belong to nature. It belonged to Amelia Earhart. With cutting edge technology and undeniable proof, the truth is rising from the depths. The mystery is no longer what happened to her. It's why we never found her until now. The Woman Who Defied Gravity Long before her name became legend, Amelia Earhart was already redefining what a woman could be. In an age when flying was still new and women pilots were even rarer, she didn't just break records, she broke expectations. With her leather jacket, windswept hair, and sharp gaze, she became a symbol of possibility in aviation and life. By the 1930s, she had already done what few dared to dream. She crossed the Atlantic solo. All eyes are on Amelia Earhart. She embarks on her quest to become the first woman to fly around the world. She set speed records. She flew higher, farther, and braver than anyone expected. But for Amelia, it was never enough to simply follow a path. She needed to create one. Her final mission would be the boldest yet, a flight around the world along the equator, the longest route possible. With navigator Fred Noonan at her side, Amelia Earhart and her navigator Fred Noonan take off in a Lockheed A-10 Electra. She took off in a custom Lockheed Electra, chasing the horizon in a global arc that few had ever attempted. They made it far across continents, oceans, and storms. But on July 2, 1937, something went wrong. As they neared the speck of Howland Island in the vast Pacific, the plan is for them to land and refuel at Howland, after which they'll continue on to Honolulu, and then make the flight to Oakland. And that's a flight that Earhart has made before. Her voice crackled over the radio. We are on the line 157 to 337. We are running north and south. Then, silence. No distress call, no confirmed crash, no goodbye. Just two people, an aircraft, and a world holding its breath. It was the last time anyone ever heard from Amelia Earhart, or so we thought. The Vanishing, 1937's Greatest Mystery Within hours of Amelia Earhart's final transmission, alarm bells rang across the globe. The U.S. Navy and Coast Guard launched what would become the largest and most expensive air-sea search in history. Nine ships, 66 aircraft, a quarter of a million square miles of ocean scanned. And yet, nothing. No oil slick, no floating debris, no sign of the Lockheed Electra or its two passengers. It was as if the Pacific had swallowed them whole. President Roosevelt authorized a full-scale emergency response. Radio operators replayed every static-filled second of Earhart's final words, searching for hidden meaning. Experts debated wind directions, fuel limits, and celestial navigation errors. But all they found was more uncertainty. The disappearance was as devastating as it was baffling. Amelia hadn't just vanished. She'd done so at the height of her fame. Her mission was followed by millions, and her face was known in every newspaper. To lose her, with no explanation and no closure, turned tragedy into obsession. Rumors grew. Did she veer off course and crash into the sea? Did she find land and survive as a castaway? Did hostile forces in the Pacific theater capture her? With every year that passed, the silence deepened. And in that silence, the mystery of Amelia Earhart only grew louder. The ocean had taken something more than just a person. It had taken a symbol, and until now, it has never given anything back. Theories and dead ends. For decades, 
the void left by Amelia Earhart's disappearance became fertile ground for speculation. Without a confirmed crash site, debris, or bodies, the world filled in the blanks with imagination, and sometimes desperation. One of the most enduring ideas was the crash and sink theory. It is suggested that Amelia simply ran out of fuel and ditched into the Pacific near Howland Island. Clean, plausible, but lacking evidence. Multiple expeditions scanned the seabed near her last known coordinates, each returning empty-handed. Then came the Gardner Island theory. Now called Nicomororo, this uninhabited atoll lay far south of Earhart's planned flight path. Some believe she landed there and survived for a time as a castaway. A woman's shoe was found, a fragment of aluminum, even a bone, but none of it could be definitively linked to Amelia or Fred Noonan. DNA testing would later cast doubt on all of it. Another theory turned political, that the Japanese forces captured Earhart while straying into their territory. A photo emerged in 2017 claiming to show her in custody. It sparked headlines, but was later debunked. The photo dated two years before she vanished. The most outlandish theory? She faked her death and returned to the U.S. under a new identity. It's a story tabloids loved, but DNA evidence and historical records quickly dismissed. None of these ideas answered the central question, where was the plane? It would take 88 years and revolutionary technology to finally begin uncovering the truth. The 2025 Breakthrough The answer didn't come from a lucky dive or a chance sighting. It came from data, layer upon layer of it. In 2025, a team of oceanographers, aviation historians, and data scientists pooled everything the world had ever gathered about Earhart's flight. Radio signals, weather archives, fuel logs, and even psychological profiles of Amelia and Fred. Nothing was left out. Then they did something no one had before. They fed it into a unified probabilistic model. This model didn't guess, it calculated. It accounted for every variable, wind drift, radio strength, likely decisions under stress, and then pointed with chilling certainty to a new location, the Howland Basin. A deep, remote trench nearly 400 miles southeast of where anyone had been looking. For decades, this region had been ruled out, its complex underwater currents making it seem impossible for debris to stay visible or intact. But the model said otherwise. It predicted a debris path, long forgotten, shaped by tides and time. A new search was planned, this time armed with the precise coordinates. There would be no more scanning thousands of miles aimlessly. The target zone had been narrowed to just over 100 square miles. And this time, they weren't sending people. They sent machines. Autonomous drones, powered by artificial intelligence and guided by sonar, descended into the depths. For days, the Pacific stayed quiet. Then, on the eighth day, they saw it. A jagged outline. Metal ribs that once held wings. Scattered parts are too symmetrical to be natural and a pattern of wreckage matched the impact of a falling aircraft, one that had tried to land, not crash. The silence had finally cracked. Tech that changed the game. The discovery wouldn't have been possible even five years earlier. The key was a fleet of revolutionary underwater machines, five synchronized drones known as ADOE units, autonomous deep ocean explorers. These weren't like the remote operated vehicles of the past, they could dive deeper, stay longer, and think for themselves. Each drone operated independently for up to three weeks, navigating pitch-black depths without surface communication. They scanned the ocean floor with next-generation synthetic aperture sonar, creating high-resolution 3D maps. These weren't just blurry outlines. They could identify objects the size of a coffee cup beneath 18,000 feet of water. What made this technology extraordinary was its adaptability. The sonar systems adjusted in real time to changes in water density, salinity, and temperature, factors that previously distorted underwater imaging. Even debris buried under layers of silt could now be detected with stunning accuracy. On board, the drones processed sonar data using pattern recognition algorithms originally designed to detect cancer cells. These AI systems flagged manufactured shapes and clusters distinguishing aircraft parts from rocks or coral formations with over 97% accuracy. And when the drones found something promising, they didn't just stop. They mapped the surrounding area, tracing how currents might have carried fragments over time. One by one, 
the signs became undeniable. A starboard engine mount, twisted landing gear, and fragmented radio equipment. This was no ordinary wreck. The tech hadn't just found metal. It had found a story frozen in the deep. What the wreckage revealed. There are uh, three traits on the image that we captured that really make us think that we found the aircraft. And uh, we've, got, we've got a little model plane here. Once the debris field was confirmed, recovery began with surgical precision. This wasn't just about finding parts, but about unlocking a narrative, one artifact at a time. The most definitive piece was the starboard engine mounting assembly. Its serial number, H1216, matched exactly with Amelia's Lockheed Electra records. There was no doubt now. This wasn't a similar plane. This was her plane. Nearby, search teams recovered a portion of the landing gear. The metal bore compression patterns are consistent with a deliberate water landing, not a chaotic crash. The angle, the impact marks, and the stress signatures all pointed to a controlled descent. Amelia had tried to save the plane. She hadn't panicked. She fought for survival until the very last second. Then came something even more personal, Amelia's flight jacket. Preserved by the cold and low oxygen environment, the leather was worn but recognizable. Stitch patterns and custom patch outlines matched photos from her final departure. And there was more. A small compact case, likely hers, and a partial navigator's toolkit etched with the initials FN. Fred Noonan. Inside the kit, weathered paper showed faint pencil marks, course corrections not on the official flight plan. They were trying to adjust. They were thinking, planning, and reacting. Even fragments of the radio equipment told a story. The transmitter was still set to the international distress frequency, and the antenna appeared functional until impact. They tried to call for help right up until the end. The emergency survival kit was found open nearby. Items like fishing line, flares, and water tablets lay scattered on the seafloor, as if quickly retrieved in a panic. Amelia didn't vanish without a trace. She left proof that she fought and hoped for one more sunrise. Reconstructing her final hours, researchers could piece together Amelia Earhart's final hours for the first time in nearly a century, not with guesses, but with evidence. It began early on July 2, 1937. By 7.30 a.m., Amelia and Fred were close to Howland Island, within 200 miles, but an uncharted storm front disrupted their path. Fred's celestial navigation was rendered nearly useless as clouds hid the stars. The recovered chart fragments and modified course markings confirmed multiple attempted corrections. They were trying to adjust, recalibrate, and find their way through the haze. By 8.43 a.m., Amelia sent her last known transmission. We are on the line 157 to 337. We are running north and south. Behind those words, investigators now see something deeper, dwindling fuel and narrowing options. Recovered parts of the fuel system show corrosion patterns consistent with only 20, 25 gallons remaining at the time of ditching. That was barely enough to keep flying another 30 minutes, not nearly enough to reach Howland. So they made a decision. Digital reconstruction of flight data and recovered navigation tools suggest Amelia changed course, turning southeast, likely hoping to reach the Gilbert Islands. This was a risky move, but it may have been the only move left. As time slipped away, cockpit settings confirmed their final preparations. Throttle assemblies were dialed to landing positions. Flaps were deployed. Even the fuselage's wave-facing angle showed textbook water landing techniques. She didn't crash, she landed with purpose. At 12.42 p.m., Fred Noonan's wristwatch stopped. At the same time, all mechanical instruments froze, the moment their journey ended. Evidence from the survival kit and gear positioning shows they escaped the sinking aircraft and tried to gather supplies. But the Lockheed Electra slipped beneath the waves faster than they could respond. They survived the landing, but the ocean, eventually, took everything else proof over theories. The discovery in 2025 didn't just reveal a location, it dismantled decades of speculation. One by one, the myths surrounding Earhart's disappearance began to collapse under the weight of hard evidence. The long-standing theory that Amelia was captured by Japanese forces in the Marshall Islands? Impossible. 
The wreckage lies hundreds of miles from any Japanese-held territory. The photo that once sparked headlines, allegedly showing Amelia and Fred in Japanese custody, was re-examined and definitively dated to 1935, two years too early. What about the Gardner Island hypothesis, which claimed Amelia survived as a castaway on Nikumaroro? Artifacts found there once seemed compelling, aluminum, bone fragments, and a jar. But the recovered aircraft parts from the Howland Basin tell a different story. More damning, DNA tests later showed the bones from Nakumaroro belonged to a Polynesian male, not a Caucasian female. Even the crash and sink theory, partially correct, missed the mark. It was right about an ocean landing, but wrong about the location. Amelia didn't go down near Howland Island. She flew farther, trying to find a new path. A final act of determination. The wildest theory that she faked her death and lived under the name Irene Bolam was already discredited, but 2025 sealed it completely. DNA from Amelia's leather jacket and personal items was matched to living relatives. The identity was never in doubt. Most telling of all, the radio equipment. It wasn't broken. It was transmitting right up until the water claimed it. No sabotage, no conspiracy, just a woman, a storm, a dwindling fuel tank, and a final effort to survive. Legacy Restored, the final chapter. Amelia Earhart's story hovered between legend and uncertainty for nearly a century. Her disappearance became a riddle too big for one lifetime to solve, and in that vacuum, she became more than a pilot. She became a myth. But now, the ocean has returned her to us, not as a mystery, but as a human being who faced impossible odds with clarity, courage, and composure. She didn't vanish into oblivion. She fought to the very end, and the evidence tells us that. The landing was controlled. Her emergency kit was opened. Supplies were scattered. She tried. Fred tried. They didn't panic. They acted. And that changes everything! We no longer need to imagine Amelia Earhart's last moments through foggy speculation or fictional theories. We can see them clearly, a pilot making the best decisions with what little she had left, a navigator recalculating one more time, a team trying to survive, not as heroes, but as people. In a way, Amelia's final flight was a perfect symbol of her entire life. Bold, calculated, brave. It wasn't a disappearance. It was a final journey into the unknown, one she met with open eyes and steady hands. Now the legend can finally rest, not in uncertainty, but truth. She didn't fall short of her goal. She soared far beyond it. Because Amelia Earhart didn't just fly into history, she became it.